welcome to the GSTL starting early today. I am Wolf, with me is Caldor, and today we have NS Hosa up against TSL. Exactly, and guys, while you just saw those hot six cans that we had on screen, uh, I'm sorry Wolf, but I have to do it. Do you guys remember when we casted yesterday's match and we had those two hot six cans and actually uh, Wolf was complaining that someone stole them out of the, out they of the fridge? Did, no, they, they did, man. They put them in the freezer. I, that's no. Today, I actually, we had two new cans here and I walked straight back to the, uh, well, the backstage area and wanted to put them into the, into the freezer. So I opened it and guess what I found. Can you see those two? Can you you see that they are like really are like coated with ice and they are frozen they are solid frozen so it's not my fault I didn't do it it wasn't me I swear you did I didn't no somebody else put them there I put them in the refrigerator the bottom part the bigger part I remember putting them in the in the door the that refrigerator guy. door I put them in the refrigerator <laughs> door okay no, there's didn't. no refrigerator door in the freezer man somebody moved them or somebody else Ironically enough, put two of them in the freezer and somebody sold two of mine from the freezer. They wouldn't steal them from the freezer because they'd be frozen. Guys, you be the judge. Is that really like the no, story? This really I happened. don't think so. Everyone's trying to put the blame on me here. Like It's a framing, okay? We saw the real thieves yesterday, okay? It's not me. I didn't put this in the freezer. Somebody moved it trying to set me up, all right? Make sure you take part in the picture event. <laughs> But, uh, Change of topic. <laughs> Back to StarCraft. Um, I don't know how long it's going to take these hot sixes to defrost. Maybe we should leave them on this table yeah, for I days. So. Well, the thing is, once they defrost, I mean, the taste should be the same, right? Like, there shouldn't be any problem. Well, we have more cans, so that's fine. But, well, guys, we have a nice StarCraft 2 GSTL match today, and we have NS Hosa up against TSL. The yeah, our player stats, you can currently see the race distribution, and once again, we have to point out that TSL is, of course, a very, well, with a very, very strong Zerg lineup. Yeah. Six Zerg players in their roster, that's half their players. If you can see, our information is in Korean, but the, uh, of course, best contributor for TSL is. None other than Symbol with basically a perfect record going down there. And of course, Jokshi is the same at the bottom left. And you can see our captains and coaches are in Korean, but we have Coach Lee and Polt as the captain and coach, or coach and captain of TSL. And you can see the NSO also coach this information as well. But let's not talk about that. Let's talk Nine about Symbol. Zero. Yeah. Wow. Put him up as the first player. The first player actually today is Jokchi, who is at a 5 to 1 record, and he is up against TSL's Shine. Shine himself with four wins and one loss. Let's see if, uh, who's coming out ahead here today. This is going to be a great match. It's actually taking place on Antigua Shipyard. So, a little bit interesting to see that TSL is putting one of their Zerg players as out as the first player on Antigua. I, don't, I wonder, you know, I actually don't know because I'm not, uh, you know, I'm on a team anymore and I'm not talking to Gome TV about this. But before, uh, you always knew the map before you picked the player. But then. I think recently you pick your player first and then you're just oh, they told changed it? Yeah. So yeah, that's a little you bit sure? weird. I, I that think so. Awkward. I think so because there was one there was one map selection that happened uh, when I was still on FX Open, I believe, where we didn't know the map before, but then the map was told to us afterwards. I think either way, like I may be wrong because I like I said I don't know, but uh, this choice, it seems to me that would be the case. Why would you yeah. pick a Zerg player on this map unless you're so confident? Well, the last time that I uh, I checked it, it was that you still knew the map, but they might have changed it. You're right, because this choice is a little bit odd, but with this many Zerg players, yeah. they might just want to use exactly. a Zerg player Get it out first. Of there. And uh, ma just use a Zerg player first, and they have a lot of good players to fall back on. But who do you actually want to seat first if not a Zerg? Do you really want to seat Gold first? Punisher, you know, not really. Center exactly. or Anori, you gotta save Anori for later, he's your only Protoss. Exactly, so yeah. I think a Zerg player is fine, and a player like Shine definitely has a good chance. And let's be honest about it. Would you expect Jokchi to be first if you are TSL? No. Would you believe that NS Hosa is sending out Absolutely their best not. player first? I would have expected someone more like Sculpt to come out, for yeah. example. Uh, maybe someone like Freaky. Freaky has you know come out fairly early before, but not. I would not expect Jokchi, not at all. Well, here they are. Here they are indeed. And that's Hosa coming out. And... You know, the choice of Antigua Shipyard, to go back to it just briefly, it made, uh, it made, we may just see a two base all in, Zergling, Baneling, I mean, uh, Baneling Roach, for example. He may have practiced something like that for his Terran opponent as soon as he found out he was playing against Jokchi. I'm really curious to see what style he's going to pick. The depth of Ennis Hosa is quite big. You can see Tassler there on the right, uh, <laughs> as well as Jokchi and, of course, the rest of them. 
Sage. And we always talk a little bit about how a play, well, how TSL has a slight disadvantage when it comes down to the team lead because they have so many Zerg players now therefore a little bit more predictable than other teams. But with the strength of their Zergs, it's not really all that true. It doesn't make that much of a difference yeah. because they're just so strong. But let's have a look at the NSOSA lineup. Here they are, first players, the Protoss players for the team. Sage, Tassada, Sun and Brave. Indeed. Some of those players are a little bit unknown. Of course, Sculpt, Jokshi, Sting, and Salvation. Salvation being the only player on that list who's a little bit unknown. And of course, Seal and Freaky. Freaky unknown until this season, where not only did he qualify for Code A, but showed crazy investor play. I'm looking forward to the guy. I'm looking forward to him play today. And here they are, the bottom left, with Freaky and Seal sitting next to each other. Yep. And. This is, of course, a university team. They live and train at the uh, NSOSA University, in fact. Well, there's, it's not the NSOSA University, it's just HOSA. <laughs> but you, you checked it out. You don't have to be actually studying at the university yes. to be part of the team. That is correct. Well, here comes their opponent. It's going to be TSL Millennium. Right now, no Millennium players staying with TSL, but that will be something that happens in the very near future, perhaps even during this season. Their lineup a little bit smaller, but it has been expanded a lot from what it once was. Still, like you said, very Zerg heavy, but it doesn't feel lopsided because of the different styles from all these Zergs and how strong all of them are. It's a really, really strong team, and I'm actually looking forward to how they're going to do today. Not only to Shine's performance, who is a very strong Zerg player, was able to qualify for Code A, but on the other hand, also to see Polt again. Yeah. Polt will likely come out, but. Colt no longer really is the ace. The ace spot has been given to Symbol these days. Well, with a 9-0 record, that's what you would kind of expect. So he's just... That guy is... Wow. He's, he's crazy. Well, he deserves it. And he was able to reach the round of eight. Yep. We casted those games at Code S, so he is an amazing player. He's still in the tournament. And well, let's also look at the lineup. Reveals the Terran players. We have actually uh, three of them, uh, three Tarans. It's Holt, Punisher, and Sentra. Indeed, and some of our Zergs here are going to be Ragnarok, Hyun, and Symbol, but that's not all. We also have Revival, Shine, and don't forget the Protosses, and Nori, and Value, formerly known as Serrano, making up the Protosses. You know, even though we have multiple Protosses and multiple Terrans, in reality, we basically have one Protoss and one Terran. We have Inori and we have Pult. The other players are not as strong. They haven't realized their full potential yet. And it's very unlikely Center or Value are going to come out today. We're not going to see uh, Punisher. He lost in Code A, and you know he just hasn't proven himself in the team league. Doesn't have as much experience. There's a very low chance, unless there's a specific snipe build setup, that we are going to see these players. And if they have a lead, they might use him to give him some exposure. Right. Yeah, that's something that team league, team league is always good for as well. But the players just joined the lobby, so we are ready to get things started here at the GSTL today with NS Hosa against TSL. Uh, it's going to be a good one. It's certain. I'm will. excited about the first match. Jokchi against Shine. I did not expect that NSOSA would send out Jokchi. And him facing Shine, this is proving to be a really good match. Jokchi, of course, a very strong player against Zerg. When he was uh, winning the GSL finals, he had to be the Zerg player, had to be Lenok. And now he's up against Shine, a very strong up and coming Zerg. So this is going to be a pretty good match. Indeed, I mean, this guy is a champion. He has played more than anyone else in the team league for his team. He's done the most. He's got 1.2 average wins here. He's the favorite player, of course, but that should be a good match nonetheless. Yep, he's gotten an all kill before. He's played a, about 15 times or so, I believe it is. Very similar style to his his teammate Sculpt, but a more refined style, I would say. And if you think about it, Enesosa is just changing things up a little bit, because so far in the past, they usually use Jokchi either last or as the fourth player. So uh, very late in the rounds, and now they are showing the big guns right away. Uh, certainly so, and as such, he is going to have to really get some wins early here. When you make such a, a bold statement by sending a player like this out first, and he loses in the first round, then things can get really slippery, really messy with the rest of the plans that you have set up. And our starting player for TSL, we discussed it earlier, it is of course going to be Shine. Someone who's shown good results this season and has qualified for Code A. Yeah, exactly. He has qualified over TLO. Yep. 
a great ZVZ there. TLO just one game away from qualifying, in fact. Yeah, and the Code A qualifier. And, uh, well, back then he had also a little bit of bad luck. If you guys remember the games, he actually had a couple of units in the Nidus network that he kind of forgot about. He realized it later on, but it was already too late. The main fight happened. And therefore, Shine advanced. It was a 2-1 win over TLO. And here he is. Pretty yep. strong player, and let's see if he's able to win against Jagji. This is going to be a pretty big match for him. I like the choice of Shine as a starting player. It seems more logical than picking Jagji first, but putting Jagji out makes a statement. And I, I mean, I respect both teams' choices. I really feel like Shine is the more typical choice. A good all around player who's come in for the team before, an all around player in all matchups. And uh, it gets him a little more exposure for his Code A match. And Shine is, well, the, the thing process is, uh, with Shine in, uh, on the first map, you have a player that is able to get take a few wins, but you're not sacrificing a player. You're not sacrificing right. one of your ace players. So you kind of hope that he's going to take a map or two, but in the end, if he loses, everything is still all right. And they have known about the, their opponents for about a week now. So they've had that much time to prepare. These two players have had more time to prepare specifically for a map, a matchup, and a player more than anyone else. So this could be our most uh, strategic game, especially for Shine, as he is going to be playing on Antigua Shipyard here. Our match is starting. The map is loaded. This is the GSTL with Calder and Wolf, NS Hosa, and TSL. Let's jump into map number one. And we are live with the game, ladies and gentlemen, to the bottom of the map, Antigua Shipyard. In the red, we have our NS Hosa player. It is... NS Hosa, Jack G. Some call this guy the one-hit wonder. Did get a Code S championship. Has been floating around Code A. But definitely still a top-notch player. Looks really good in team. Yeah, indeed he does. He's facing a Zerg, as mentioned. He's one of the six Zerg players that are currently in the TSL roster. To the top of the map, in the blue, starting for his team we have. TSL, shine! And you talked a little bit about how they knew about the map and the matchup up front, so they will definitely have prepared for this map, and we will see what exactly Shine is doing here. We saw Zerg players mixing it up a little bit against Terran lately, especially against the early command center build that we've seen out of so many Terrans in the last few days. We saw double hatch before pool, a strategy that the first time I think occurred on maps like uh, Calm Before the Storm, and we saw it on Entune Valley against Protoss. So something that Zerg players get a little bit more comfortable with in general. Yeah, we'll likely see this as soon as uh, the Command Center first is scouted, because he's going to hatch first, Pool's going to be late as a result. Command Center first for Joshi and typical Joshi style is being hidden. He's not going to make it on the low ground. He's no Marine King. So this drone will actually come up here. He may stop at the, uh, if he goes in the main, he doesn't go all the way to the north, he may not see this, so in one way this is safer by Jachi, but in the other way, uh, see, since he's going to show this barracks, it doesn't matter. Okay, he knows by now. Yep. He saw, oh, actually, did he see, I don't think he saw the, I think we saw it just on camera, no, no he, he actually did it, not spot it. He will see there it There it is. And even but he started his pool already. Yeah, seeing the uh, barracks here kind of lends to, oh, okay, he's not going two racks in the middle of the map. He may have one barracks in the middle of the map, but that's really unlikely. I'm kind of, I, I feel like because of this, I think he knew it was a command center first, but he just wants to be a little bit safer. He doesn't feel as comfortable going double hatch before pool. Then even though that's becoming more common and it can be done, it's still extremely difficult to do. And if you're not comfortable, if you haven't practiced it a lot, I mean, it's not a build you want to do. It's changed the timings quite significantly. Yeah. So if you actually start with a double hatch before you start with your pool, you still have to know how many drones can you build, how do you just put them on the on the um, different bases, when get, do you get your pool, when do you get your gas, when do you start with the first fuelings, what do you need to do in order to be ready for a potential attack of your opponent? Yeah, certainly so. At this... You know, this map is going to be a tough one for a Zerg player, especially against someone like Jachi, who's so well-known for his draw play. You can see the map win rate by race. This is in the GSL, only 38 to 29, Terran favored. 
Uh, in Korea, it's a little bit closer to 50% than that, but still Terran favored. And by in Korea, I mean in all Korean tournaments, including online, esports weekly match, ESB, things like that. Right now, I'm a little bit curious about what exactly Jachi is going to do. Uh, the question has already been answered, I think, as we see on the production tab, not only the factory, but also the reactor. So he's relying on this reactor factory Halion style that was really common for months now. And we see him also with a third base. And this would enable his opponent to do some kind of aggression build with Roach and Bane Links. We might see it. No, actually, we won't. No he gas, already yeah. has. Yeah, exactly. He has no gas and he's building queen number three and number four. Which also means that he will be able to spread his creep and defend against the Hellions without too much of a problem. Unless Jokchi really commits it, tries to sneak past, yeah. and Shine uh, does not pay too much attention. And he is getting a third hatchery right now. A little bit earlier than you would against a normal one barracks expand, but with the command center first, he has the time to do this. The thing that I want to point out is if you are facing this alien strategy and you're relying on your queens only to defend against it, what you need to do is you need to have one queen in a position where she can block the ram. That is the important, the crucial part, because if the Terran player decides that he will sacrifice his Hellions in order to trade for drones, he will just try to sneak by. If you block the ramp, you can get all your drones at the natural, you can mineral walk them into your base and can uh, just hide them. The queen blocks the ramp and you will lose nothing. But as soon as the Hellions sneak into your main base, you're in big trouble. The second wave of Hellions, if there is one, will hit your natural while you're defending in your main base. So this is definitely something that Shine has to be aware of. Yeah, he really does. I mean, people have been doing this more and more recently where they just, just like you said, sacrifice the Hellions because you will lose them no matter what. But because the Queens are so much stronger recently, people know that using the Hellions to control creep is not something they're as useful at anymore. And we're going to see him actually sneak by doing just this right now. And the Queens, in fact, are not in position on the ramp, so he will get into the main base. Oh. This is exactly what you said, man. You saw the future, and we are watching it unfold. The drones have been pulled. He not will not get very many, but he will get some. Yeah, he will get some. He takes a few of them down. This could have been a lot more effective, but he took down a few at least. He took down five with, uh, well, he could have killed more. It was a nice split by Shine, but as you already said, this is a this is a big problem, and this is exactly what I was talking about. Now imagine if there would have been more Hellions. Suddenly, two, three, or four additional drones would have been killed. As it is, he already lost five workers, but it could have been worse. He was really close to yeah. losing another His three or four. His split was actually amazing. Uh, the way he pulled his drones around the hatch, split them into two groups, really nicely done. I feel like the targeting could have been better for Jogji as well. But the damage has been done. He cleaned up some of those lings, and he's continuing to, to pressure this creep just ever so slightly. His 1-1 one -one upgrades are way ahead of Shine's as well. They're both already halfway done. In fact, the plus-one attack, like, three-fourths of the way done, whereas Shine has just started seconds ago his 1-1 one -one upgrades. He's got his lair finishing up here. He's continuing to mine gas, and we'll likely see some tech very soon. He was a little... I don't want to say he was lucky because he defended well, but it could have been worse for him, so in the end he ended up in a situation that he can very well handle. But as you can see on the minimap already, Shine is known for his creep spread. He has an insane creep spread, and these four queens are doing nothing else but placing down tumors. He has six queens in total, that's a build that he's very, very comfortable with. The one thing that I don't like, which I have to point out here, is that in his main base he didn't add a tumor to spread uh, the creep in his main. This is really important later on when you are facing drop play, yeah. but it's something that does not really matter now, may not even matter later on. But with all these queens that he has on the map and with all these creep tumors that he has available, one creep tumor in the main base would have been a good thing just to make sure that the, uh, uh, later on he's prepared, because now if actually there is going to be some kind of drop, there is still a lot of potential for Jakchi to hide the drop up to the point where yeah. he stims and runs in. And you know, there there will be drops because there absolutely will because he's going at Festers. And as soon as Jakchi knows that, he is going to drop like crazy because with no mutas to shut him down, drop play is the best thing you can have on your side. Baneling that's finishing up here. The armory finish, he hasn't started 2-2 two -two yet. He has he started combat shields, cancelled them to get plus 2-2 two -two first, and then we'll start combat shields fairly soon. I like this choice because it furthers his upgrade advantage, and the combat shields are not going to be too important defensively. They're more important offensively for him right now. He's going to have to deal with these investors, though. I love this Viking. We talked about this Viking a lot in the last few days, and I really like that Jakchi is one of these players that will add a Viking to look for the overlords, even if you don't kill too many of them. 
You can just ensure that there's no scouting going on. But this is already Jagjik preparing for a potential drop play. He's going for plus two, plus two as we speak. And with the infestation pit that you pointed out, we have the standard composition for Antigua for Shine. He's going uh, for Hive already, and we will see also this here. He's yeah. going for plus two, plus two ground attacks. He's on Ling Infester and will transition into an Ultra List edition. Yeah, also, this is like an aggressive way to take yeah. it forth. He's taking the fourth in the center, and I think he's going to try to use Ultra List to hold that with, uh, you know, just holding the Watchtower at the top of the Infester. And Ultralist, it's really hard to attack into that location. Ultralists are just more viable on this map because Brute Lords can be caught out of position. It's a very big map, so with a slow Ultralist, you always have a uh, sorry, slow Brute Lords, you always have a big of a problem defending your yeah. fourth base. And the fourth base has been taken. He's also taking the fifth now. And I think that we are going to see. Oh, there they are already. Yeah, my bad. Sorry, I didn't see them. We have the spore crawlers already being built for uh, Shine. So and I smart. guess he will also add a couple of spine crawlers. There's the first one. So he wants to defend. And I love it. This is exactly what you have to do with a Zerg in the mid game against the drop. Um, against the Terran player who likes to drop. And it always pains me when I see that a Zerg is not doing it and loses economy because of it. This is actually really cool that he's chasing and hunting down these overlords. As soon as he saw one, he was like, well, I can drop and kill this. Four spine crawlers going up now. I mean, he is really doing this. I, I love his position. Look at this. See if he can kill these lings as they come up. He's got the meta back here. He can't fight that. Great positioning here. Man, Jokshi is, is playing so well, but I really like the style that we are seeing from Shine. It's very unique. This is a very fast Ultralist Cavern, and he is actually putting these defenses up just prematurely, 100% safe. He's got two hatches up that if he defends them, he knows he has the economy to continue Ultralist Prediction. He could switch into Broodlords, like you said, they're not as viable on this map, but I like the style that we're seeing here. It reminds me a little bit of Lucky, his, uh, how he sets up his defenses here. Lucky is the one player that I always refer to when it comes down to setting up your defenses in the mid game when you have this event. Oh, nice snipe here on the medibag. Wow, that's a little bit of a mister for Jakchi. This shouldn't have happened. He was not pressured at this point. But coming back to the, the original thought, Lucky is like the player, the best example for a Zerg player who will play defensive in the mid game and set up these structures and they are everywhere. Drop play will not, they, it will not work. No, it will not, man. He's got them everywhere. He's got them at his third base. They're every location where a drop could potentially play in. Now this is Joxy's first aggressive move to deny the creep and he is doing it quite well. The investors are out and he needs to use them really, really well. The first Ultras are on the way too as well as Kitan is plating, but he can't actually fight yet without the ultra. It's not against this many siege tanks. Really important on this map is the center. If the Terran player is able to siege up here, and that's what uh, Jakchi tried to achieve, and he made, uh, well, he was able to do it. As soon as he sieges up here, you can take down the space that we see on the lower ground. You're controlling the two mineral patches, and at the same time, you have a very short push distance to the base at the bottom. But Shine is ready. He has his units in position. He does not have the Ultralis yet, and he doesn't have Adrenal Glance. He's going for the Banelings. Oh my god, he, uh, he's actually a little bit out of time here. Jakchi with a nice timing is pressuring him. Yeah, he's actually hit just as the Ultras were being made, so this is so difficult. Now the Ultras coming around the right side, fighting only Siege Tanks. The Banelings coming from the right, and the Bungles, they are nice, but the Ultras a little bit distracted, not attacking the main force, and more Infestors starting to fall. He this needs another bad. Fungal, he needs another Fungal here. He's really in trouble. He had to transfuse earlier on with the Queens in order to keep the hatch alive, but right now he's trying to make this happen somehow. Jakchi is at 150 supply against 135 as now Shine goes in with the last Ultralis with a couple of Fester Terran. Tries to take down the Siege Tank. The Siege Tank actually survives, takes down another Queen. Lings are running in right now, trying to seal the deal, trying to finish what the Ultralis started and he actually pulls it off, he barely does, holds his hatch. Barely, that was razor thin, the supply even now, but the hatch remains alive and the second wave will uh, kind of go back for a little bit. He's gonna get the second siege tank. He may decide to attack again. Command Center on the right side has been spotted. He was oh, trying wow. to deny that, but he's a little yeah. bit too slow. He tried to move in, we don't have it on screen yet, but he tried to move in with his overlords when he saw that the Command Center was, walk, uh, was uh, flying to the top right. There it is. And he dropped creep with his overlords, but just a second too late. He sends Marines up here not only to kill the overlords, but he knows this will be attacked by Lings immediately. And he'll be able to clean it up. The planetary will finish, and he can actually kill every single overlord now, which will start to, uh, it's not going to supply block him, but it's going to make him eventually have to remake some of those. He's at 170 now. Spire is on the way. That transition will likely occur very soon. He's going to lift up and get out of here, though. Nicely done. Shine is very, very, uh, his multitasking here is shining through. He's continuing to spread his creep towards the south, even though he lost a lot in the center. Kept that hatchery alive. 
He's got overlords all over the map, spotting for drops, trying to deny these bases. He's sending his zerglings around, but he still has to deal with this very strong army of Jachi in the center. I want to point out once again uh, how important it is that Jachi, uh, that, that Shine Sen, uh, well, place these defensive structures in his main base at his natural and at the third, because if not, Jakji would now drop everywhere and he would just make a force shine back. This would be positional drops that he will use. He will sacrifice units in a drop just to force Jakji back with his army and then attack at the fourth base, but he can't do it. So this is very, very important. This is something that you guys should always be aware of when, uh, as we see the game unfold, because it takes a lot away from the possibilities that Jakji has to, to actually pressure his opponent. Yeah, that's very, very true. Uh, oh, hold that thought as these Marines are going to be fumbled, but they are well split. Some of the tanks are on siege, and it looks like this fight is going to eventually go to our Terran player. The trade for the Zerg, though, decent. I don't think he should be continuing here. He needs to pull back because he's trying to get Broodlords out, and Joxy pushing through will take out two additional Infestors, and those are important Infestors yes. while he's trying to get his Greater Spire up. Infestors, the big problem here. If they die, then you are in trouble. Top right, another base now being established. Four Shine plus three plus three started for Joxy, but we we have our Zerg already with his additional upgrades. He has the plus three armor upgrade, and I think he has the attack upgrade as well. Yes, yep. indeed he does. So he's fully upgraded, and this is trouble for Jakji, especially as he does not see the uh, Brute Lord transition just yet. Yeah, he's not prepared for that. He hasn't even added star ports. He's not even prepared for the possibility of that transition. Depots here, nice addition. Going to completely shut down this run by as the rocks are still alive. A great Seven game. Great starting game, game here. Yeah, this game is so sick right now. I'm loving, you know, I'm a little bit more impressed with Shine than I am with Joshi because Joshi's just playing straight oh, up and standard. Nice. Oh, wow. He's going to have to lift this. And guys, this is one of the biggest problems. If you have the orbital in the middle of the map, of course you can lift. That's the one advantage that you have over a planetary, but with a planetary you're you safe against... You get a positional... Against, exactly. You get a position you can defend, and even if you lose it later on, you can still get another one in there. can already build it on the high ground, but the problem is, against run buys, you're really vulnerable. And this run by made Jakchi move back. He had to move back because of it, so Shine, with a great move to buy himself a little bit more time to get these Brute Lords into the picture. Yeah, and he's gonna do it again. Forces more SCVs off the line. He will finally shut this down, but he moves back a second time. Do you remember when we talked about how important the Infestors are in uh, yeah. the, with this combination and that a sub couple of Zerg players we cast in the last few days actually neglected them too much? We have nine Infestors now for Shine. He has this very, very powerful combination. We have five Brood Lords, we have Corruptors as well, we have Infestors, and this this, this spells trouble for Jakji. Yeah. now at Star Pulse, but if Shine is going to hit now, oh, he already knows that he's not able to defend he it. He picks up the orbital, yeah. yeah. He's going to the south. Exactly. There is actually, in fact, a unit there to deny him. It's a Zerg, he can just burrow that to deny that hat or the, the commands are down there. This is Zerg versus Terran, as in my opinion, it should be played. There's hardly anything to criticize from our Zerg. He's just been playing this so aggressively, but never overextending himself. Even in units lost, he's not that far behind because he's just been engaging every battle the way he should be. He's denying this command center with a ton of Zerlings out the south. And Joshi's starting to drop again, or rather just running in because he knows the sport crawlers are there. He's attacking the 9 o'clock position now, taking out a queen, and he will lift up and get out. He needs to do little things like this because there's not much way for him to take control of the center anymore. The problem that Shine has at this point, uh, there are not a lot of them, but what is a little bit problematic is he does not really have too many Brute Lords and Corruptors. He would need a few more if he really wants to make this. Well, he has, he has ground units as well. This is the one thing that he has going for him. But if he wants to make this happen, like, ah, uh, the expansion, it dies. Yeah, he neglected his defense uh, of that base just a little bit. Oh, in the middle of the map. Oh, the, the, oh, the Infestors, he needs to be careful here. And the Brute Lords, I was just pointing out, there are only five of them. Here come the Corruptors, and this is yeah, exactly the problem. His air units, they were not enough. So Jokchi trying to make good use of this. Yeah, he went in when most of the units were trying to defend that hatchery to the top right. Not only did he get the hatchery, but those units were out of position. The Ultras, the Banelings, they weren't there. If you really want to make this air composition work, you have to sack a few of your ground units because what you try to go for are roughly 8 to 10 Brute Lords and then at least the same amount of Corruptors and Infestors. Then you are safe against Vikings because you can fungal them, you can attack them with the Corruptors, you can use Corruption as well, and at the same time your air units will be able to provide the Brutelings on the ground so that your opponent is blocked. You fungal in as soon as the uh, Marines try to stim. But with the ground units that he has, he has ground support, but he has to be very careful with his air units. It's not necessarily a bad composition that he has, because he can rely on uh, Ultralisks as well on the low ground. But it's one where he has 
it's a lot more micro intensive. Of course, yeah. And these these units at the top right are gonna deny a potential hatchery again. He's actually reinforcing the drop he already sent over. This is gonna be a really important engagement. The tanks are on siege. The banners are coming around the right side, but the tanks do target them. I'm Very not well sure done. if this is going to be enough, though. I don't think so. There's so much DPS right now, but the air units have been fungal. He needs to get rid of all these of all these medibacks and infestors. That is the biggest problem. Killing the Marines won't help them. They are so cheap. They are easily rebuilt. He has the production facilities. He needs to take down those gas-heavy units. That's the one thing that he can really do. Now he's trying to go in once again, but without the infestors for the fungals, the stutter step for Jagji is beautiful here. He's being forced back, but he takes down so many many units and look at these medibags. They are all floating over there doing the healing right now. A great Baneling hit though and the Ultras they are not stopping. And then he had just enough to push through the first wave, but he has to pull back. I like that he saves his Ultralist. Three additional investors on the way would have put him up to back back up to four. Jockey desperately trying to get that fourth base. He still doesn't have it, and that's what he desperately needs right now because he does not have the minerals to continue to produce these units anymore. And this is the strategic play that we talked about when we mentioned how, uh, how Shine was approaching this. He has Zerklings everywhere, shutting down these attempts of getting a fourth. Early on, he was able to force his opponent to lift it and move it back, and now Shine has the better economy, so he can just try to hit these timings. He needs to make sure that this fort is not going to stay there for long. He's a bit on a clock. Yeah, he certainly is. But he has five bases now. Yeah, he's landed it. Oh, here we go. He tries to move in. He knows exactly that this is the time where he can do the most damage. But at the same time, we have a huge army for Jagchi. And Shine realizes it, tries to back off, loses another Ultralis. And these Vikings are, of course, now useless for Jagchi as Shine is only relying on ground units, trying to save the investors. Another beautiful fungal hit, but he does not have the numbers. And yeah. look at the Mule Hammer. He's dropping the Mule Hammer right away. We have yeah, how many? Not Seven. Ah. He's actually going to take out this hatchery very likely. Here, but Oh, that's what he needed. He needs just one more to kill several of those medivacs and the Vikings. They're all on top of each other. He just doesn't have an investor. He doesn't have any investors right now. In fact, 16 links coming out, but that's not going to help him clear this as the now the bio army has been healed. He's trying to run in here and pick off some SCVs, but the defense is too good. And as you said, Shine is kind of on a clock right now as he has not rebuilt his hatchery. Big problem here for Shine. He's on four base against four. He played a very great game, very strategic, but now he is basically without tech units. He's only relying on Zerklings. And, well, Jagchi, with getting this command center in the middle of the map, he was able to drop the Mule Hammer. He has the massive income right now. He's at 2,500 minerals. There it is. There we have it. And this is something that Shine, he cannot compete with this. No, it's it's going to be virtually impossible. Look at how quickly he's remaxed up to 183. Whereas Shine is staying down at 121. He has so much gas, but he cannot spend it without minerals. I, I feel like he, he doesn't even quite realize his problem as he's making two extractors at his top right base. He needs only minerals right now. It's not a time to make an extractor. Those are two drones he's not going to have. He needs every mineral he can get right now. He needs to take control of the center again, but without gas, to, uh, without minerals to support his gas to make more infestors, to get more corruptors out and take that top take that watchtower. Without the watchtower, he will never stop Jokshi's mining and he'll never be able to take that base himself. He's going to lose the hatchery at the top right or the center. He can't have both. And now we have uh, Jokshi moving forward. Marines are so cost efficient now with three to upgrades and all these medibags. And there are no support units for Shine while Jokshi has so many medibags. That's the one thing that Shine was never be able to kill. And now he's moving and trying to defend his base, but it is Jokshi who prevails. He snipes the hatch. He takes down the drones. This is Jokshi claiming victory. This is Jokshi winning over TSL Shine. Yep, he certainly will. There's not much else to say. The last of the Broodlords falling to the Vikings. Look at those medivacs. They have been around for so long. Medivacs don't have kill counts, man, but I bet they, if they should like implement how many units would have died if they weren't there, man. I bet it's probably in the hundreds at this point. Yeah, and it this definitely is, would be. This is, I mean, he's making two investors, but he's got 20 supply. The creep is being cleared up here, and Shine is going to have to leave this game pretty soon. There's not much else he can he do. He doesn't do anything. He's currently, look at his picture. He already stopped playing. He didn't Gee -gee. use his mouse and keyboard anymore. This is game, a great, great starting game. Shine with an impressive performance. He, he looks great, man. Oh, he looked awesome. I loved how he played this, how he approached the game. He was so good.
But, uh, well, Jokchi is just on another level here. The one problem that Shine had, he never took down the gas units. You can kill the Marines over and over again, but they are cheap, they are easily rebuilt. You can build them in uh, with the reactor two at a time as well in each barracks. So what you need to take down, you need at some point, at some point you need to, to kill the medivacs. The medivacs, the Vikings, all those units that the Terran player will have a problem of rebuilding. Yeah. That's obviously the most important part. Without the medivacs, or, you know, the Marines just do not have the power. If you have a good, a few good fungals with no medivacs, and all the units will absolutely die. But if there's medivacs sitting over almost every bio unit that you have, then all the ones that are being healed are not going to die to the fungals. So you need additional fungals, and you've got to take those medivacs out one way or another. They weren't repaired, but you just had so, so many. Why is it that you're... Oh, I guess you're, you're I'm holding I'm trying right to defrost the okay. COD 6 that you put into the freezer yesterday. <laughs> I noticed that in the middle of the game, I looked at my can, and mine was completely frozen still. But yours was, like, not frozen. I was like, am I a cold person? Am I, like... You are. Uh, is your, on your side, is like, a lot warmer than mine. I'm like, what is going on here? Because your can was, like, I'm, completely defrosted. I'm that looking. hot. Yeah, man, you really are. I guess so. <laughs> no, I'm trying to defrost my hot six. All right. Well, I don't know if you can do that. You might. You might need a microwave. I'm not sure. <laughs> no, you're not putting my hot six in a microwave. You already put it in the freezer yesterday. I'm actually uh, so happy that it didn't combust or anything. Well, I yeah, I actually that was my first surprise when I, when you showed this to me. I was like, they're not broken or bulging or anything. They're just frozen. Well, it's a can, so I think that only happens to to glass bottles. Yeah, yeah, I guess you're right. That's that was. Uh, a gr great game we just saw. Yeah. I'm still in shock that those hot sixes were in the freezer. I can't believe that, but let's see who the next TSL player is. Shine with a great performance, but it was not enough to take Jokchi down. Hyun! We have Hyun. I'm excited about this wolf. This is good. This is good indeed. Another Zerg. The map of choice for Hyun is going to be Daybreak. Hyun is a very good all-around player. He likes to play that heavy Ling Baneling style that we've seen so much recently, and he does it well. He's good with the run buys. He goes up to 150 Zerglings at times. He just makes as many Zerglings as he can afford to have. I have to say, though, I'm, I'm a Hyun. I'm a little bit of a Hyun fan. I really like his style. I like his play. I like how he de how he improves constantly. But the last few games that I casted from him at the GSTL, I did not like. He did not really play well. I think he underperformed. I think he can do better. And I want to see him do well against Jokchi right now. I want to see a great game of him. Jokchi is a formidable opponent. He will have to bring his A game here to make this work. We just saw how amazing Shine played. And still was Jokchi who came out ahead because he is such an accomplished player. He is such a great TDZ player. The NS Hosa star here up against another Zerg. And this is going to be exciting. Yeah, it certainly will. I, I'm, you know... Hyun, every time I see him, I feel like he's still in metamorphosis. Like, he has not quite reached his full potential. Every time I see him as well, his hair is just a little bit longer. He clearly hasn't gotten it cut in a while. It's covering his eyes now. But we are going to take a five-minute break. When we get back, we'll have Hyun against Jokchi here at the GSTL.